note lecture on interactions between organisms. The first thing we're going to do is symbiosis, and this is when two unrelated organisms live closely together for an extended period of time. With mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism are the three main types of symbiosis. Mutualism is when both species benefit. Commensalism is when one species benefits but the other is unaffected. Parasitism is when one species benefits and the other is harmed. With competition, this is not a type of symbiosis, but it's when two unrelated organisms live in close association. With competition, neither species benefits. Even if they are competing for a mate or competing for food and one of them wins, yeah, that winner gets more of a benefit than the others, but even so, they still had to expend energy to compete for it. It would be better if there was no competition at all. So really, competition is a lose-lose situation. Neutralism is when neither organism is benefit or hurt. This is a very rare form of symbiosis because most of the time there's some type of competition or something that um, causes those organisms to not have that neutral relationship. So here are some examples of each type. Mutualism, as we have discussed before, can be seen between ants and the acacia tree. We've discussed that in previous lectures. Bees and flowers have a mutualistic relationship because the bees provide pollination and uh, for the flowers, and the flowers provide food for the bees. This um, clownfish and the anemone that it lives in have a mutualistic relationship because the clownfish is provided with a safe place to live and the anemone gets any food that the clownfish drops down so it increases the amount of food that it gets. Commensalism is when one species benefits and the other is neither helped nor harmed. For example, these barnacles on the whale. The barnacles are being helped because they are being taken around the ocean to get more food, but it does not hurt or benefit the whale to have the barnacles on its skin. This is a picture of a, an orchid, and orchids don't actually put their roots into the ground, but put them into puddles in the branches of trees. This doesn't hurt the tree, nor does it benefit it in any way, but the or orchid benefits because it gets to live high above the canopy and gets water. This is a picture of some um, birds and a cattle. The birds get the benefit of food, and the cattle doesn't care if the birds are there or not. They're not helping it or hurting it. Parasitism comes in two different forms. They can be internal, like this tapeworm, or external, like this leech, aphid, or mistletoe. Each of these organisms is damaging the organism that it's on. It's taking away blood or some type of um, phloem from the tree, some sugars that it produces, or um, the food that an organism eats. So it's harming it while, while these guys all benefit. Predator and prey is really an example of a competition because the prey, like this hare here, is trying not to get eaten and the lynx is trying to eat. Whenever we see predator-prey relationships, we see their population numbers oscillate, which means that they go up and down like this. So as the prey increases, that's the snowshoe rabbit, that provides more food for the lynx. So the lynx population increases. But when the predator's population increases, that means that more of these lynx are getting eaten, so then they crash, which means that now there's no food for the lynx, so then they crash, which means there's fewer predators for this rabbit, so they increase greatly, which means there's lots of food for the lynx, so then they increase, which causes more predators for the rabbit, so they decrease, which means there's no food for the lynx, so they decrease. So the oscillation of the predator very closely follows the oscillation of the prey, and they are very dependent upon one another. So predator and prey are always trying to develop strategies to live, either behavior or physical. Some that you might know of are camouflage, weaponry, warnings, things like shells or ambush, stealth. Natural selection will select for these beneficial traits. Some specific ones are aposematic coloration or mimicry. Aposematic coloration is a stay away color. It's a bright color that tells organisms that they are going they are poisonous or venomous not to get near them. Mimicry is when one organism will copy another because one is bad or has poison or venom and this one wants it to think wants everyone to think that he does and then camouflage camouflage is just to blend in 
So here's some aposematic coloration. Obviously, you're probably familiar with the hourglass on the bottom of uh, the belly of a black widow. That is just a warning that they have a lot of venom. These are poison arrow frogs. So they have poison that excretes from their skin and they're all very bright colors. These, sometimes moths and butterflies have coloring like this to tell predators that they taste yucky. Here's some examples of mimicry. So this snake here is a coral snake. They're very venomous and this is a king snake which when they put them next to each other like this, it's not really obvious, but if you were to run into one of these snakes in the woods, would you be 100% confident whether it was the venomous coral snake or the not venomous king snake? It's hard to say, especially if you're an animal, you might just kind of avoid anything that has the, that stripe pattern. Many, many insects have this black and yellow striping when they have a stinger, but sometimes even beetles will mimic them or this is just a fly, will mimic them to make it look like they have a stinger when they actually don't. Camouflage is organisms blending into their environment, so it can be pretty good camouflage. Here's some examples, this praying mantis blending into its orchid, or a lizard on this log, this bright yellow spider that lives on this flower. Here's some more examples. There's a caterpillar right here lined up along the leaf so you can see its legs but it's very it blends in very well or a chameleon here's um, a seahorse that lives on that coral a jaguar an owl this gecko is its head is right here and there's its body and its tail a stick bug looks very much like the sticks or a leaf or even arctic fox blends in with its environment as this pomeranian does with all of the stuffed animals so organisms also have two types of competition. It can be intraspecific or interspecific. These prefixes we've seen before with intrasexual selection and intersexual selection. So intra means within. So within a species competition would be intraspecific. Interspecific means out, inter means outside. So interspecific competition is between organisms of differing species or outside of their species. So we look at population growth in two different models. Exponential is what's shown on the blue in this graph. And this is an ideal way for organisms to grow, but it is when they have unlimited resources, which occurs not very frequently at all. So more often what we see is a logistic model, which is the realize, what really happens. This is when a population reaches its carrying capacity, represented by the letter K. This is the maximum number of individuals that can be supported in an ecosystem based on the resources that are there. Sometimes organisms will grow exponentially and then have an overshoot where they will come back down and level off at their carrying capacity. Lots of things determine carrying capacity. So here's another example. Right, this is the carrying capacity of the blue line, but this is what the actual population would do. It's not going to stay exactly even, it's going to fluctuate around the carrying capacity. What causes that carrying capacity? Well, there's two different types of factors, density dependent and density independent. Density dependent factors are when there's a bigger impact on dense populations. So that would be like limited food and water, shelter, predation, disease. Things that, if there's a lot of organisms in a small area, it's going to have a bigger impact. Whereas density independent factors are those that affect all populations the same, whether or not they have a dense population or not. That's going to be things like weather, climate, natural disasters, where it doesn't matter if the population is dense, it's going to affect everybody the same. These are the two ways that we reach a carrying capacity, or what determines the carrying capacity, that organisms must fluctuate around in their ecosystem. That's all for today, so please um, complete your assignments and contact Mrs. Jewett if you have any questions. Thanks.